Throughout this entire basic marine electricity series, we've been saying that the information presented is cumulative and that we assume you already know the material covered in the previous courses. Well, this final course stands alone, yet it rests on the knowledge from all those other courses. That includes safe practices in the presence of potentially lethal alternating current, fundamental principles of DC circuits and electronic equipment, and the behavior of marine batteries. This course focuses on the particular ways that the marine environment works to destroy electrical systems on boats and the things you can do to prevent that from happening. In this course, Preventing Marine Corrosion, you'll learn the four types of marine corrosion, the causes of galvanic corrosion, the causes of electrolytic corrosion, techniques to prevent galvanic corrosion, and techniques to prevent electrolytic corrosion. The American Boat and Yacht Council dedicates two of its standards, namely E2, cathodic protection, and A28, galvanic isolators, to preventing marine corrosion. In this course, we'll define the terms galvanic and anodic and cathodic as they relate to marine corrosion. We'll also demonstrate how you can put them to work preventing corrosion on your boat. ABYC members can read the full text of those standards at www.abycinc.org. Marine corrosion is a topic around which you'll hear endless pseudoscience and misinformation, but it really isn't witchcraft. To clarify how corrosion happens, and therefore how to prevent it, let's start by identifying four types of marine corrosion. Those are simple corrosion, crevice corrosion, galvanic corrosion, and electrolytic corrosion. Because this series is called basic marine electricity, we should clarify that the first two types of corrosion in that list are not electrical in nature. Rather, they are naturally occurring chemical reactions of metals in the marine environment. But the latter two types, galvanic corrosion and electrolytic corrosion, very definitely are electrical in nature. The bulk of our attention here will be on techniques for preventing those two types of corrosion. Note that throughout this course we avoid the term electrolysis, which introduces more confusion than it resolves. Virtually all materials degrade over time, especially those exposed to a harsh environment. In most cases, this is a normal part of the service life of any component. When molecules on the surface of a metal combine with oxygen to create a more chemically stable metal oxide, we call this simple corrosion. Over time, almost all metals exposed to oxygen in the presence of moisture, in other words, the marine environment, will corrode to some degree. Simple corrosion often takes years or decades to destroy a part. If your bronze propeller slowly corrodes over 30 years of service, then it's delivered its expected working life. The gray dust on bare aluminum or red streaks on mild steel are common examples of the metal oxide caused by simple corrosion. With some metals, the most common examples are stainless steel and aluminum, this oxide coating is the metal's very protection against corrosion. It prevents oxygen from degrading the base metal beneath it. Crevice corrosion describes what happens when stainless steel is deprived of oxygen, yet subject to moisture. It's a chemical reaction, not an electrical reaction. For this reason, stainless steel isn't recommended for such underwater services through hull fittings. On sailboats, crevice corrosion can destroy chain plates, for example, when leaks develop through the deck. In this case, the chain plate is exposed to standing water but no oxygen. Deprived of its oxide coating, it corrodes and will eventually fail. The galvanic series represents the natural electrical relationship among metals. When any two nearby metals are immersed in an electrolyte, they become electrodes. Metals with lower corrosion potential are less noble or anodic. In an electrolytic cell, Anodic metals lose material to metals that are more noble, or cathodic. One solution to galvanic corrosion is to install sacrificial anodes in a system where all underwater metals are bonded together. We'll describe this bonding system shortly. A version of this table is found in ABYC standard E2. Of the four types of metal corrosion, the most extreme is electrolytic corrosion, sometimes called stray current corrosion. This is very definitely an electrical event. In this scenario, amperage from an external source rapidly accelerates the galvanic reaction. Electrolytic corrosion can occur when metal with an electrical current flowing into it is grounded, that is, floating in any body of water. 
It can happen if a short develops between an external current source and some part of the electrical system that's tied to the boat's underwater metals. The stray current will exit the boat from an underwater metal fitting, creating electrical potentials near battery voltage levels, orders of magnitude higher than the natural voltage levels shown in the galvanic series table. This type of corrosion can destroy metal parts in a matter of days or even hours. There are four methods we can use to control galvanic activity in a properly wired boat. To protect a single boat, we can do one of two things. Isolate the metal from seawater, or bond all underwater metal to appropriately sized and placed anodes. When your boat is plugged into shore power at a dock with several other boats, you can isolate your boat by using a galvanic isolator or an isolation transformer. We'll discuss each method in this course. Okay, so right now we're on board a Sea Ray 580. We're in the engine room. Uh, the boat's equipped with two manned marine diesels, but it's a very systems-rich environment here in the engine room space, which is really quite large, as you can imagine. I want to focus on the, the bonding system, which is all part of the cathodic protection on this boat. You see these green wires are 8-gauge. They connect all of the metal components that are in contact with seawater both in a through-hull environment as well as the sea strainers, which are actually inside the boat completely but have seawater, raw water running through them. Here's our common um, grounding bus bar. Everything's tied together into one system. A little later on, we're going to show you how to test to make sure the cathodic protection system is is set up so that we've got adequate protection for all of these underwater bits of metal that we're looking at. How can you know if your boat's cathodic protection system is doing its job? Well, you can use your DVOM to measure your boat's hull potential. That is the average of the potentials of all your underwater metals. To take this measurement, you'll need a silver-silver chloride reference cell. You can obtain those from www.boatzinks.com. Plug the reference cell into the negative terminal, or the com jack, of your DVOM. Place the reference cell overboard at just about the depth of the metal being protected. Next, connect the positive lead to the engine negative bus. The voltage reading represents the hull's basic potential. It should be a negative number similar to those shown in the galvanic series table. The reading you get with an anode attached to the system should be at least negative 200 millivolts greater, that is more negative, than the average reading without an anode attached. Note that the figures shown here presume that the boat is floating in salt water. Cathodic protection in fresh water works a little differently. Recommended anode materials are magnesium for fresh water and aluminum for brackish. Hull potential readings tend to be lower by a few hundred millivolts. Okay, we're still aboard the Sea Ray 58. What we want to check right now is the level of cathodic protection. Basically, we're trying to see if we have enough anodes uh, in the water to uh, protect the underwater metals that are attached to the bonding system that we looked at a little earlier. Now, to perform this test, we need a silver, silver chloride reference cell, which we're going to attach to our regular digital multimeter, and we're going to take some readings. ABYC's E2 standard talks all about um, what the appropriate protection levels should be. We'll look at that in a few minutes. So I've got my reference cell all cleaned it off. I'm going to throw it overboard. You don't want it to go to the bottom. Uh, it's a good idea just to get it at about the same depth of water as the uh, protective anodes are. So, you know, th three or four feet below the surface is usually 
perfectly adequate. You really don't want it right on the bottom of the boat or, or the bottom of the water that you're, you're uh, floating in. So somewhere about halfway would be great. So we're back down in the engine room on the Sea Ray. You wouldn't always have to go uh, into the engine room. It really depends on the boat. What we're looking for is the grounding bus bar where all of the green wires, or sometimes they're green with a yellow stripe, come to a common point. Uh, it's referred to in the standards as the engine negative terminal. So, um, <laughs> or it's bus. So it's kind of an either-or situation. What you really want to look for are the green wires. So again, our reference electrode is in the water. The lead from it is um, plugged into our COM terminal on our digital multimeter. And our, our plus wire is the one that we're actually going to hook up to the grounding bus bar. Now, if you were using an analog meter, your terminal connections would be reversed. Okay, at this point I'm going to connect this lead to my negative grounding bus bar and we're going to take a reading on our meter. And we see that we have negative 902 millivolts. Now, I can tell you that that is perfect for a boat of this configuration. The lifespan of sacrificial anodes can vary from one season to the next. Why is that? Well, several factors come into play. These factors include water velocity. That is, boats exposed to current need significantly more cathodic protection than those in still water. Boat usage. Boats that are used more frequently need more protection. The conductivity of the water. Galvanic activity increases with the conductivity of the water, and conductivity increases with salinity. The acidity of the water. As pH decreases, the corrosion rate increases. Deterioration of protective coatings. As protective coatings deteriorate, the need for cathodic protection increases. Plugging into shore power at a marina notoriously exposes boats to accelerated depletion of the sacrificial anodes. Why is that? It's because all the boats plugged into that shore power system are electrically connected via the green grounding wire. Together, they all create a multi-boat galvanic cell. Your anodes are protecting your neighbor's underwater metals. A galvanic isolator breaks the link of this giant galvanic cell. How does it do it? By blocking the galvanic pathway in the green grounding wire between the shore power inlet and the boat, while still providing ample grounding protection. According to ABYC standards, this is the only device permitted to be installed in series in the green grounding conductor. One caution is that galvanic isolators are designed only to block low-level galvanic current on the order of 1.4 volts or less, not full battery voltage. Either the newer fail-safe models or a system with a monitor ensure that your grounding conductor maintains its continuity. As we said in an earlier lesson, electrolytic corrosion or stray current corrosion is the most damaging and fastest form of corrosion. It can be caused by any of the following faults. Wire splices and terminal blocks in bilge water. Carbon dust on motor brush holders. A short to the shaft on the bilge pump a faulty bilge pump float switch, chafing of wire insulation, or the inadvertent use of the bonding system as a DC negative return. Is there stray current running through your boat? A good place to start answering that question is to check the bilge water. Set your multimeter to the DC volt scale. Touch the black lead of your meter to ground. With your meter's red lead, probe through the bilge water. Turn different equipment on and look for a DC volt reading on your meter. If you do find any, the circuit that you just activated is the source. Trace out the problem and repair it. How can you find out whether you have any stray current running through your own boat? One method is to use an inductive ammeter, or an amp clamp. Make sure that yours has the capability to read amperage for the equipment on board. Clamp it around a bonding conductor with all circuits shut off. One at a time, turn on DC circuits. If you observe a reading, you found the culprit. Trace and repair the circuit in question. Here's a second way to discover stray current in your boat. This method involves using a silver-silver chloride reference cell. You can find these at www.boatsinks.com. First step is to submerge the electrode in the water surrounding the boat. Next, attach the clip lead, that is with an alligator clip, 
to the engine negative terminal. Now begin activating circuits. A meter indication that rises, that is, goes more negative or positive, indicates an induced voltage in the bonding system. Trace and repair the circuit that induced the increase in negative potential. The American Boat and Yacht Council dedicates its E2 standard to cathodic protection. What follows here are several helpful excerpts from that standard. Quote, The need for a cathodic protection system for metal appendages on non-metallic hulls may not be justified if the metals coupled are galvanically compatible, see galvanic series table. However, individual testing on a case-by-case -case basis is necessary. End quote. So this means that many boats have neither a bonding system nor a specific cathodic protection beyond the anodes on, say, an outboard engine. Regarding trim tabs, here are three items. Hull-mounted metallic trim tabs shall be installed in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions and may be isolated from the boat's cathodic bonding system to reduce the load on the boat's cathodic protection system. Also, trim tabs shall be electrically isolated from their, their electrically actuated mechanisms in accordance with ABYC E11, direct current electrical systems on boats. And finally, if a stainless steel trim tab system is connected to a boat's cathodic bonding system, the cathodic protection system's output rating shall be increased to provide the additional required protection. Here's another item. All metals that are to receive cathodic protection from the cathodic protection system shall have a maximum resistance of 1 ohm to the cathodic bonding system anode. And then here are some notes. 1. A resistance as high as 1 ohm may degrade the cathodic protection system performance. 2. Propeller shafts do not provide reliable electrical continuity to the boat's cathodic bonding system. 3. Rudder posts shall be cathodically bonded by means of a flexible conductor positioned to allow full rudder movement without stressing the cathodic bonding conductor or its connection. So what are your best defenses against stray current? Some of the following items will go a long way. First, having a switched positive side only, intact grounding and bonding, high and dry connections that are out of the bilge, and finally, good chafe protection on all of your wiring. Isolation transformers break the direct link between AC conductors coming in from the shore power and your boat's AC wires. They do this electromagnetically, using the principle of induction. In practical terms, it means that your boat's white neutral conductor and green grounding conductor are both grounded on your boat, not on the dock. That means AC circuits are completed on the boat. By isolating the green grounding conductor, they also stop the DC path that could lead to a galvanic cell with neighboring boats. The downsides of isolation transformers are that they can be heavy, cumbersome, and expensive.